Oh, good morning, church. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to be doing something different on a Sunday morning. They let me out of that area every so often. But yeah, you shouldn't give me a mic for too long. Well, we'll see how this goes. But for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dylan Cousart. I'm the, the worship ministry director here, and uh, it's my absolute honor to get to lead, uh, lead the worship team here. We have some wonderful wonderful people that help on the team, incredibly dedicated, incredibly talented. Um, it's, it's very humbling uh, to lead them. And um, shameless hug time. There's only a few of us. So if you have any interest on, in serving on the worship team, <laughs> come talk to me. I'd love to hear about it. And actually, even if you don't have any interest in serving on the worship team, come talk to me. It's actually very hard for me to meet people on Sunday mornings because I'm usually running around like a crazy person. Uh, trying to get last-minute tasks or or these little ones in under control because they're nuts. Uh, so this is I'm wearing the same shirt. <laughs> so this is my son Graham. He is four. That is my daughter Vienna. She's about to turn three. Um, and then the one who is really doing the heavy lifting is my wonderful wife Pam. And um, yeah, she's expecting our third, by the way, so that's, that's exciting <laughs> and terrifying. But speaking of Pam, yeah, I heard that sigh from here. A lot of people don't know this about her, but she is fiercely competitive. Like, it's, it's really funny. And I, I didn't know this about her, like, um, it took, took me a little while to see it, but well, even when she was in college, you know, she was, she was an athlete all growing up, and she played college sports, she played college soccer, so she doesn't, she doesn't mess around. Um, so she's got that work ethic, that fire, you know, and it's a hobby of mine to try to bring it out and, and make her mad. It's, it's fun. <laughs> but we used to have, back when I was a student ministry director in the old building, we had this group of high school seniors that would come, and and they were they were so much fun. It was the class of 2015, but um, they would stay after youth group, and and we'd usually stay at the church till 11 p.m. playing Xbox or ping pong. But foosball was the one that kind of emerged as the the dominant and competitive space, where the bulk of the trash talking took place. And and I, I thought I was doing such a good job as the student ministry director. I've got all these guys staying after and. But I, I soon realized that it was not about me at all. It was about beating Pam in foosball. <laughs> it had become all about that. She, she was a merciless terror. And I fell in love. <laughs> so it brings up another story. Yeah, we, we, can't, we can't play foosball anymore. It's, it, yeah, no, foosball's right out. But I recently got this game. Some of you might have seen this. It was being advertised really heavily on, on social media for a while. And I refrained because it was like 30 bucks. And I was like, we will kill each other if we buy this game. But fate intervened, and I saw it in a thrift shop for $3. <laughs> so I had to swing on it. Um, yeah, so, so if you don't know the point of the game, there's two different colored like little hockey pucks, and you have the rubber bands, and you shoot them, and there's a divider in the middle, and you can see there's that tiny slit. So you have to shoot your puck through that into the other person's side. So the first person to get all their color onto the other person's side wins, but you're both trying to go through the same opening. It, it, is, it is maddening. And within about 10 minutes, I had thrown all the pieces across the room against the wall, had to go like take a lap to cool down, she was just absolutely destroying me. But I did win the last of like 15 games. And we decided, well, I decided as the man of the house that that's the only one that counted. <laughs> so there's, it reminds me of another story that's been floating around good news a while, and, and you longtime members will, will have definitely heard this. Uh, so David Nicholas, one of our sister churches, is, is Spanish River. And he's the pastor down there. And he tells the story of playing golf with an 85-year-old gentleman against some younger staff members. And uh, at hole nine, they are absolutely kicking their butts. They're like seven strokes up. And so David asks the old man, he says, should we give the other team 
six or seven strokes to maybe make, this, make the back nine a little better. And to his surprise, the old man came back, red-faced and spitting, no, stop their necks! It's like, whoa. Yeah, it's just like, what he means is like, win, show no mercy at all costs. Like, especially, I mean, it, it makes a little more sense if they're younger staff members. He's probably like, nope, we're taking this. But that show no mercy attitude led me to two conclusions. One, I'm pretty sure Pam is related to that scary old man. <laughs> and two, on a much more serious note, this is how we must be with sin. Ooh, we got quiet. We have to ruthlessly eliminate it from our lives, show no mercy, stomp its neck. Let me pray before we get into the word proper. Heavenly Father, I thank you for just this church, Lord, for, for your word that we have a place we can gather safely to hear it, Lord. And, and as a quick aside, Lord, I pray for our country. Recent events in the past couple of days are are terrifying, Lord. We pray for our political system. We pray for all our political candidates, candidates for their safety, Lord. And we thank God that, that uh, Trump was not killed. Regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, Lord, that's not the type of country we'll, we want to be in, Lord. May we return to you. Lord, would you show us mercy? We're in such desperate need of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start out with First Peter. Chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. If you've got your Bible, you can, I'll give you a second to get there. If not, we've got it up on the screen. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I want you to remember this. I'm going to read it again. As obedient children, specifically this line, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. There's a part of me that I think sees that, well, the last line of that and thinks of it as this furrow-browed parent, like, you be holy because I'm holy. But as I was reading it, uh, it, preparing for it, I love how verses sometimes just hit you from a completely different way. And this is one of those ones that hit me. The work of redemption is all on Jesus, right? We don't earn it. So he says, you shall be holy because I am holy. He's the one who makes us holy. It softens that verse so much and fills it with so much hope. And if we are in Christ, the scales have fallen off of our eyes and we've seen our need for a Savior. But Jesus is the one that makes us holy before God, pure and set apart, forgiven and justified. And now the work of sanctification begins. And what that means, it's a churchy word for learning to walk in the holiness that Jesus has given us. So we can't lose our salvation, but passages like the one I just read, and it's up on the screen, make real the danger of not escaping the passions of our former ignorance. There's an ever-present temptation to sin, and sin never lies dormant. It's not something that you can just compartmentalize in your life. And, and trust me, that's something I know about. Trying to just keep a little sin off in the corner, keep it in its room. We'll talk more about that later. But, but as those called to be holy and made holy by the blood of Christ, we can leave no room for it. We have to ruthless, ruthlessly, yeah, ruthlessly eliminate it wherever we find it. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. While I was thinking about what it's like to be a Christian and still trying to keep, keep your worldly 
desires, the, the passions of our former ignorance. I, I got this picture in my head of a person finger painting, which is a very childish thing to do and hard to not stay messy, but finger painting in a tuxedo. You just, it, it's, it's foolish looking. You come off looking clownish, and the desired effect of the tuxedo is I would be willing to bet completely lost on the people you're trying to impress. As we go out and are trying to witness to people but have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God, it's like finger painting in a tuxedo. You're talking to somebody else spattered in paint thinking that you're wearing a tuxedo. And I've been so guilty of this over the years. A heavier example of what I thought it's like is gangrene. Even if you cut 99%, the infection still is going to spread. You have to get all of it. You can leave no provision. You have to put it to death. I'm going to say this over and over again. You have to stomp its neck. Romans 8.13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I thank Jesus for the Holy Spirit. Because apart from his power, we would have no hope of this. So as I'm talking about some heavy topics today, and, and really coming down hard on sin, I don't want you guys to think that I'm trying to preach at you guys and make you feel like failures. Because this is all by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way that we can live by it, live through this, that we can make it, that we can walk successfully in this life. So today we're going to be looking at a specific sin that um, is described in Scripture as being against our own bodies. Most of the other sins in Scripture, it's talking about against the Lord, against the Lord. But this is the one where it says it's against your own flesh. Our culture has gone far beyond tolerating it and, and revels in this. So fair warning, this one might sting a little bit because it's stuff that we're pretty used to. And uh, another warning, if there's young children in here, we're going to be covering some more mature topics. Um, so I'll leave that up to you. You want to leave them in here, but turn with me to Matthew 5, verses 29 to 30. We're continuing our look at the Sermon on the Mount. And yeah, this is kind of right, right in the middle of chapter 5. And so Jesus says this, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is a difficult teaching to cope with. Um, there's a real temptation to try to broaden and downplay what Jesus is talking about, or even to say that he's speaking hyperbolically, and I don't, I'm not here to argue whether this is hyperbole or not, but regardless, it paints a picture that this is something Jesus takes very, very seriously. He's willing to go, it's better to go into heaven maimed than to, than to, have, this, than to have this on you. But as, um, as always, context is very important when looking at Scripture. So we're going to look at the verses right before this. What is Jesus specifically talking about? So we're going to go back to Matthew 5.27, and it reads this. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. So now there's no getting around it. There's no getting around it. This passage is about lust. We're all guilty of this in some way, shape, or form. And it's, it's easy for us to downplay a sin like lust because it is everywhere. We can see it as harmless, especially in its infancy, and even dismiss it as cute or humorous. 
So here is your try not to laugh picture of the day. So it's a scene from the movie The Lion King. We all know the scene. Patriotic Christian mother is against the frankly obscene look Nala gives Simba after he lands on top of her in the jungle wrestling scene. <sighs> it's funny to think about that, that something like, okay, people are getting all up in arms about, so she, okay, she gives him a, a spicy look, but, but they're wrestling around in the grass and the, the, the song, the whole bit, it's uncomfortable, frankly obscene. <laughs> So, yes, this is a joke. This is a joke. But it does paint a picture. So keep in mind, this is from 1994. A long time ago. <laughs> but, yeah. But so often we, we make light of sin. And, you, yeah, okay, good. I was like, yeah, get, that, get that dumb picture off the screen there. We got we to gotta get back to, the, back to the serious stuff. So there, there are eternities at stake, at stake. And Jesus has a way of raising the bar to show us just how desperately... We need his grace. The Jewish thinking of Jesus' day on adultery was sleeping with someone that isn't your spouse and if you're already married. And most people, would, I'd say, would mirror that today. But as we look at in a second, lust in and of itself is adultery. You might say, okay, come on, checking somebody out or casual flirting, that's not hurting anybody. Or even pornography. It's by yourself. People on the screen aren't real people. It just affects you. As a quick aside, um, pornography does deeply and profoundly affect the person viewing it. It chemically alters you're thinking it carves neural pathways in your brain, patterns of behavior. It makes me think of like a vinyl record. There's a track on it and the needle falls into it, follows the track and plays whatever is written there. That's basically what pornography does to your brain. It affects our thinking, which affects our behavior. And if our behavior is affected, it's gonna affect the people in your life all around you. Not to mention that every click drives up the demand for more to be made. And pornography is driven largely by human trafficking. The more demand for pornography is more demand for human trafficking. Very real people and very real modern day slavery. Jesus in his goodness has removed any room for this kind of behavior. Matthew 5 verse 28, when he qualified what God meant by adultery... He said, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So all it takes is lustful intent. Now, lust, lust is kind of a churchy word. Simply put, it can be substituted with desire. If you're making someone the object of your desire, man, woman, some, anyone that's not your spouse, if you have sexual desire for them in your heart, which is coveting, so we're to two of the big ten right now. Adultery and coveting. Our culture is in deep, deep trouble. So many of us. American culture and really a lot of American Christians have become very calloused to this whole topic, to lust and pornography. Things in TV shows that would have been shocking just a few decades ago are commonplace now. I, yeah, it, you can't watch anything without there being something that is fueled by this, that is sex-obsessed. And it's no accident. I, I truly believe that the enemy wants to corrupt the hearts and minds of the next generation before they ever have a chance to know Jesus. Or even if they do know Jesus, to leave them like that fool in the paint-spattered tuxedo. Drifting, stagnant, and calloused. And we all know what callouses are. If you, if you use your hands, you get them on your hands. If you, have, if you walk barefoot a lot, like I did growing up, yeah, I've got like TMI, but my feet are like rubber. It's, it's, it's gross. <laughs> but yeah, we get that buildup of hard skin. Like I was, I was once helping a stranger 
I need to brag on myself for a second. I was helping a stranger on the side of the road change a tire. They weren't particularly grateful. In fact, they made fun of me for having soft hands. <laughs> Because I didn't have enough calluses or something. I don't know. But it's a defense mechanism our body has. So I'll use something I do know as, as an example. So playing guitar. When you first start playing guitar, it really hurts the ends of your fingers and the metal strings. Especially if you're playing an acoustic guitar, it tears you up. You can even, you can even bleed if you're playing too much. And, but as you keep doing it, your body realizes it's going to be a regular thing. It's like, okay, he's going to keep doing this to us. So it starts building up calluses on the ends of your fingers. And so you feel it less and less and less. And the signals that something is wrong, that your brain is sending, eventually stop coming altogether because it's just realizing it's just a regular part of your day. So what I'm driving at, and this, this is hard to talk about, but I will never forget the first time I saw pornography, it was shocking. My friend and I were playing in, in my front yard growing up. An older boy rides up on a, on a bicycle with a dirty magazine he had found on a construction site. And he was making the rounds. And My eight-year-old brain had no idea what I was looking at. But that picture is burned in my mind. I still remember it to this day. It ignited a curiosity. Before long, me and that same friend were staying up late and watching those warbly cable channels late at night, trying to find something that slipped through. It sounds silly and stupid, but, but when you realize that it's one step further into the trap, suddenly it's insidious. The callus was forming. The infection was spreading. Next came the internet, but only when I was at that friend's house. But before long, that wasn't enough, and I was willing to risk it at my house. The shock was wearing off, and the hook was getting set, and I was willing to, willing to risk getting caught. I learned to be sneaky and deceptive in my formative years. I learned to see the opposite sex as a commodity, I knew it was wrong, but the shock after each exposure was less and less. The callus built, the infection spread, until eventually it became full-blown addiction, sepsis. There was going to be extreme measure needed to free me from this. Occasionally, I would get caught by my parents, who are here, by the way. I told, I told my grandma she couldn't come. <laughs> Occasionally, I'd get caught by my parents, and, and there would be repentance and sorrow for a while. But even though that book was closed, I still left mental bookmarks. I knew how to get back there. I knew how to hide it. And I was raised to respect women, and for the most part, I did. But even in seasons of victory over porn, there was so much damage done that lust ran rampant in my mind where no one could see. Some of the infection was cut away, some of the callus removed, but not all of it. It was allowed to fester, and soon I reopened those secret ways and was right back where I started, relapse. Each time I was, it was allowed to take hold again, it seemed to pull me deeper. And by my late teens, I was really starting to realize that this is a problem. I can't tell you how many tear-drenched prayers I offered up to the Lord, begging him to take this away from me. It reminds me of that passage where Paul talks about, I do what I don't want to do. And the thing about that passage is, before we're saved, the flesh and our nature are in unison, they're in agreement. So a lot of people don't see a problem with all the things I'm talking about today. Like, yeah. But when we give our lives to Christ, suddenly our flesh and our nature are at odds. And so if you're in Christ and you're struggling with this, just know it's not defeat, it's not the end, but this is war. You went from a time of peace 
to by putting your faith in Christ, declaring war on the flesh. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a bitter struggle. So I didn't start seeing victory over this until I decided to give it all to Jesus. And then, of course, you're saying, yes, yeah, so yeah, give it all to Jesus. That's what we do. But it's not. It's, it's not what we do. I couldn't afford to just mostly repent. Saying sorry and, and genuinely being remorseful, genuinely being grateful for the grace that God gives us and for his forgiveness. But I wasn't taking serious steps to change my behavior. And we think about the word repentance, that's what it is. It's changing your mind, which is changing your behavior. So all the avenues of access that I was keeping hidden, keeping secret, had to be closed. I had to allow myself to detox from this. All my relapses, and this is the hard one, had to be confessed. And not partially, not downplaying them, but totally. I had to find someone I could trust to hold me accountable, who I knew would ask me about it even if I was going to try to downplay it, even if I was going to try to avoid talking about it. I planned not to rely on my own willpower, because that is a fool's errand. And that goes for any sin. The hooks were deep, but little by little, God was pulling me out. One thing at a time, I ceased making provisions for the flesh, like Paul talks about. This wasn't an overnight thing. It took time. It took humility. You'll never feel smaller than when you're confessing sins like this. It's such a stigma around it. But it's so worth it. So again, I say, if you're fighting this, don't, don't be discouraged. Results came from day by day and moment by moment, deciding that Jesus' way was better by surrendering the passions of former ignorance. And by exposing the deeds of darkness and stamping them out. And the thing is, even now, I don't dare let my guard down as a man in this culture. This is a fight to the death. When you struggle with something like this, it is for the rest of your life, you cannot let your guard down. Like any addiction, be it alcohol, be it drugs, it's the same. You need that support system. And the enemy would love nothing more than for those walking in victory to get comfortable in it. David and Bathsheba is case in point. The man after God's own heart is elevated to king. Trouble starts when he stays behind, lounging in the palace roof while the rest of his men are off at war. He got comfortable. Instead of fighting to keep his kingship, he's like, other people will do it for me. This, is, this king thing is kind of nice. I can, I can sit and relax. And Seeing Bathsheba bathing on the roof was not the crime, was not the sin. It was allowing his gaze to linger the wife of one of his men. Before long, he's embroiled in a mess of adultery, the physical kind, deceit, and even murder. He paid for it so dearly, the child from that sinful union died, and the kingdom suffered. Now, to pause real quick, I'm not saying that if you look at pornography, you're going to become a murderer. I'm, re I'm not saying that at all. Although, Another quick aside, every serial killer has a background of pornography addiction. I'm not saying if you look at pornography, you're a serial killer. But I'm saying there is a correlation between the warping and damaging of our minds and all kinds of sin that comes ahead. But another thing I'm not saying, I'm not saying you can't find somebody attractive. That, that's silly. It's something that you just either do or you don't, it, you know. But where you get into trouble is when you let that attraction take root and it becomes something, and they become someone that you desire when you have no business desiring them. That's where sin creeps in. And as I said earlier, sin never lies dormant. You can't compartmentalize it. I met a man this past week, actually, who got bit by a brown recluse spider on his leg. 
And that's a, that's a nasty bite. It, it, it literally starts rotting away the flesh around the bite where, uh, while well, you're still alive. It's really, really gross. It festers and stinks. And the thing is, if you leave it, it does not stop spreading. You have to go get medical attention. This guy waited, thinking it was going to be fine, thinking it was going to be fine. He lost his whole leg to this spider bite. When he was telling me about how he lost his leg, I was expecting it to be something more dramatic than a simple spider bite. But it, it paints this picture. If this is something you're struggling with, if lust is something you're struggling with, how long are you going to let it go? What are you willing to sacrifice to it? The thing about lust is it's a silent killer. On the outside, everything can be going perfectly fine. All growing up, I was, a, I was a nice Christian boy. And it so often seems out of nowhere that people have serious moral failings. But the thing is, David didn't suddenly and spontaneously have an affair and kill someone. There's a series of lost battles in the mind before anything like this happens, building up and building up infection, callous, building up to where you're not shocked by sin anymore. You're not feeling it. And you're willing to sacrifice so much of yourself to keep it. And so you keep making these small decisions. Having no content filter on your phone. Small decision, not a big deal. Remembering what someone at your work was wearing and thinking about it later. Locking it away in the memory banks. Putting yourself in a vulnerable, vulnerable position with that coworker. Trying to get a little extra attention from a neighbor. These are all fairly innocent things, but these are small decisions. Small lost battles. We're allowing the sin to spread just a little bit, a little bit. And we can downplay it, we can justify it. But how long till it reaches the heart? How long till it spills out and real damage is done in your life, in the lives of people in your community? We can't afford to let a sin like this sit and fester. It has to be drawn out. It has to be exposed. And it has to be stomped. Colossians 3, 5 to 10 says it this way. Put to death... Therefore, what is earthly in you, the first thing he says is sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked, and when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So remember what I said earlier about lusting being, being two sins? Well, it's four. If you're coveting, coveting, according to this, is idolatry, According to Paul, worshiping something before God. Commandments 1 and 2, no gods before me and no idols. Ouch. And here's the thing. If we're lusting after somebody, that is essentially meditating on them in our mind. And Scripture says the only thing we're to meditate on is the word of God. Hear me out. Like, I know some of you might have rolled your eyes at that. But if you're running an image of somebody in your mind over and over and making them the object of your desire, imagining what it would like to have them, imagining what it would like to be with them. Scripture tells us that's not what we're to fill our minds with. And what we fill our minds with spills out. We need to fill our minds with the word of God, not on things that are earthly, like that list that Paul made. And, it, and that list is by no means exhaustive. But let me draw your attention to verse 10 of that that last passage to the encouraging part 
We have to put on the new self. We've, we've put on the new self, which is being renewed. Being renewed, not was renewed, and if you mess it up again, you're on your own. That's not, that's not how our God operates. He knows us better than that. In 1 John 1, 9, we're given a powerful, powerful promise that we're so often unwilling to claim. And it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is something ongoing. This is a process. We have to be willing to trust God with even the deepest, darkest parts of ourselves and let him renew us into his image. Our job is to bring it to him and not part of it, all of it. And here, here's the rub that we run into. I know when I am in sin, my gut reaction is to run and hide. Like the first man and the first woman in the garden, after they sinned, they hid from the Lord. And that, that is the easiest thing to do. And, and in the moment, it makes sense. But that is worldly sorrow. There's worldly sorrow and there's godly sorrow. What I mean by that is this. Worldly sorrow is rooted in the flesh. It is rooted in the self. It is guilt that makes you run from God and it leads to further bondage, further darkness, and death. And so I thank God for the example of the Apostle Peter showing us what godly sorrow is. After he denied the Lord, the first chance he gets when he sees Jesus he sees Jesus on the shore while he's in the fishing boat. We know this story. His reaction isn't to duck down behind it and hope God doesn't know he's on the boat. He dives into the water and swims to Jesus with everything that he's got. So what's your view of Jesus? Regardless of your struggle, do you see him as somebody that you can bring it to? I get this picture in my mind that on, you know, on like a Dawn dish soap bottle, there's like a little duck. But what that is, is like when there's oil spills, one of the things they use to get the soap off of these animals, or to get the soap, get the oil off the animals is this dish soap. But you see the commercials they air, and part of it makes you roll your eyes, like, oh, you know, the person in gloves sitting there like scrubbing the duckling and everything, but <laughs> it's a good picture to have. This thing is hopeless to survive covered in oil. And if it runs away from the person that is trying to pick it up and wash it off, it's going to die. And if it lets itself be picked up and washed off and cleaned off, it lives. That's us. Whatever your struggle. He's able to sympathize with our weakness, as Hebrews says. Even though Jesus is the only one who lived perfectly, the only one who never sinned, but that means he's victorious over sin. And since he is victorious over sin, that means he has power over sin. He rose from the dead to prove it. Following him has to be our whole lives. He is worth giving all these things up for. And my younger self so often didn't believe it. If there wasn't any part of sinning that was pleasurable, we wouldn't do it. Something, stood to be, something is stood to be gained in the short term. That's why we do it. And often we don't repent because we don't want to. We might put on a show of it, but still be holding something back. We have to love Jesus more than our earthly desires. We have to put them to death. And the point for this week is the title of the message, Stomp Their Necks. Your sins, the things that that you might be holding back or trying to compartmentalize in your life, expose it, bring it to Jesus, stomp its neck. And the action step is don't fight alone. Any predator out in the savanna isn't going for the biggest, strongest animal in the pack. It's going for the one that let itself be isolated. And so I have a couple of following action steps for us about confessing, 
What I mean by that is to God and someone you trust. Repenting, changing your thinking, and create boundaries. If you repent but don't change your behavior, you're not actually repenting. Accountability. Bring people into the fight on your side. So I'm going to invite the band back up. You guys can start making your way back up. And, and as they're coming, I want to challenge you guys. I'm going to have a slide up on the screen and actually a whole loop of slides at the end after they're finished playing their song with resources for dealing with lust and for dealing with addiction. I have a list. And then I'll have slides that are going to be QR codes that you can, you can scan that will take you to the websites of these, um, of these resources. So I just want to leave you with this. I can't stress this enough, that you need to find someone or even a few people you trust that can hold you accountable, that you can confess to. And here's the other side of it. If someone in your life is struggling with these things, it's, it's easy to look down on them. It's easy to, to just see the stigma attached to the sin. But be patient, be understanding, and here's the thing. Here's your action step. Be willing to fight alongside them. Be willing to help them stomp its neck. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy, Lord. That you see through us, Lord, all the way to the deepest and darkest parts of our soul, Lord. Thank you that you are understanding, Lord, that you are able to sympathize with our weakness. Lord, would you give us the courage to bring these things to you? And would you help us see you clearly enough? Your goodness, your grace, your mercy. Help us see you clearly enough to bring these things to you, Lord. And not let them fester, not let them destroy us from the inside out, Lord. And Lord, would you give us strength in a culture that is obsessed with sex and lust? Would you give us strength to stand against it, Lord? Would you bring people into our lives that can stand with us to stand against this, Lord? Lord, we give you all the glory, all the praise, and thank you that you have more grace in you than our biggest sins, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.